Hi, everybody, and welcome to our fireside chat, which is what's the future of group uh, exercise. My name is Emma Barry. I am delighted to be your moderator today. We have got a star spangled lineup of panelists today who are going to take you through some of the hot topics of group exercise. We're going to be looking at macro trends. We're going to be looking at all the nuances, and we're going to be looking at the new customer. It is wonderful to have you with us. And we're as part of the warm up heading into the EHFF in November and delighted to be here. So before we get into it, please make sure that you have a pen and paper because I promise you there is going to be insight after insight being dropped in the next 45 minutes or so. So first of all, we would like to thank our sponsors because without these folks, we would not be here. Our industry would not be here and we wouldn't be able to have all these opportunities to be together. Now, it's a shame that we can't be together in person because group exercise, group fitness is the heartbeat of the industry. We bring people together, we share joy, and then we drag people off to the bar afterwards. However, we have this virtual forum and we're very happy to be sharing everything we know as we come out of the pandemic and into the new, new world. So my entire career has been devoted to group exercise through Les Mills, through Equinox, Basic Fit, and a plethora of boutiques around the world. Now we have an amazing panel today. And what you're going to see is they're coming from slightly different aspects of group exercise. We've got the group fitness giant Les Mills who are gonna give us some nice big trends. We've got Struct Club, which is a fantastic app which supports people digitally in their live experiences. And we've got Tribe, um, and they're going to be sharing uh, how they're expanding their boutique, their hit concept globally, and some of the awesome innovations that they're doing in order to pull people back. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce, or I'm going to have the, have the panelists introduce themselves. I'm going to have them tell a little bit about themselves, about their brand, and what they are specifically focusing on right now, 18 months into a pandemic, where the whole world has shifted round. So I have great pleasure in uh, announcing our three panelists. Uh, first of all, Amira Pollock, who is uh, a dear friend, and we served uh, some time on the WEFA board, the Women in Fitness Association, together as well. She's one of those smart, up-and-coming leaders of the future who is just doing an amazing job. She's the founder and the CEO of Struct Club, and I know that she'll tell you a little bit about that. Also joining us, we have Kirsty Angove, who is the CMO, the Chief Marketing Officer for Tribe. Just an incredible concept that she will share with you and lots of the things that they're doing. And then Amy Smith, wonderful friend uh, from Regional Marketing Director for Europe. And they have just launched a report which has just hit the press right now. And we're looking forward to sharing those insights with you. So hot topics ahead. Amira, could you introduce yourself and get us going? Definitely. Well, first off, wow. Thank you so much, Emma. A super energizing kickoff always knows how to energize a room. And thank you, Europe Active, for bringing us all together today. Uh, as Emma mentioned, I'm Amira Pollock. I'm the founder and CEO at Struck Club, and I'm also on the board of directors of the Women in Fitness Association. And in my day to day at Struck Club, we are all about bringing structure to class instruction and especially those music-inspired rhythmic classes. We're a technology company, we create software, uh, and with our app, you can design, run, share, and monetize class programming. So whether you're an organization or you're an individual instructor, you can streamline and scale execution of unique and consistently incredible classes. And we're free to download on the App Store for iPhone, iPad, iPod Touch. Uh, we're castable to Apple TV. Uh, and originally, just personally, I started Struck Club to streamline my own practice as an instructor and enable my teams at studios and clubs to scale our collective ability to offer more, better classes every time. Uh, and fast forward to today, uh, we've helped run millions of class experiences across 770 cities and 45 countries at every household name fitness center as well as online and today we are laser focused uh, these past 18 months on accelerating fitness brands who offer classes to leapfrog them into the 21st century when it comes to programming a unique experience that they can also own in a scalable way get to offering more classes quicker and just slay the game in this comeback moment just as you characterized emma Thanks so much, Amira. Um, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and then if you could take it away, Kirsty, please. 
Hi, so yeah, so thanks for the uh, the very energetic opening. I'll uh, I'll look to keep the energy up as we go. So um, my name is Kirsty Ango. So I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Tribe. As Emma said, we're a global boutique fitness concept, and I know there's been a really big narrative around boutique and those those standalone concepts and how that's going to weather both the kind of initial impact and then ongoing impact of of the turbulent 18 months that we've all been through. I think from our side, so just a little bit about Tribe then. I've, I've been with Tribe for nearly two years, which feels like a little longer after uh, everything that's gone on over the last sort of year. Um, but before that, I spent uh, just over seven years with Nuffield Health. So I've, I've kind of seen the fitness industry from a few sides, although um, there's lots of also amazing experience on this call from my uh, from my fellow panellists. And I've, I'm quite interested actually in the in some of the emerging trends that I'm sure we'll talk about, particularly that sort of well-being space, because I was probably, Emma, we were just talking before we joined the panel, I was probably talking about that two and a half years ago at EHFF in 2019, about the intersect between those things and the need to be super, super connected. Um, from tribe side, very different, so um, very specialised sort of hit boutique fitness concept um, in six territories, internationally which is a, a very different challenge for me in terms of language and culture and all that kind of stuff um, and growing really quickly which is one of the things I sort of want to address today in terms of what that really looks like in a in a post-covid world um, but from our side really it's, it's a focus on um, bringing people back and, and really advocating that sort of human interaction uh, within the studio environment and, and also expanding our brand uh, without losing our culture so staying very focused on who we are and our values and what we believe in and um, because i really do feel boutique fitness having been very group exercise allergic before i joined tribe is the way people come together and there's there's real magic in it and um, for want of a better phrase so um, that's what i'll kind of address today and then i will be taking huge insight from both amira and amy through the session i have absolutely no doubt thanks kirsty amy Thanks, Emma. And yeah, thanks for bringing the energy as always. It's always a pleasure to chat to you. Hopefully next time it will be in person and you'll be dragging us to the bar afterwards. But um, yeah, I'm uh, Amy Smith, I'm the Regional Marketing Director for Europe at Les Mills. Um, and Les Mills is a Group X uh, creator. And we've been around since the 60s, so the last 50 years creating life-changing fitness experiences. And you know, our brand purpose is the same as it's always been, which is about creating a fitter planet. and right from the late 60s when the Les Mills gyms were founded in, in New Zealand by Les himself. Um, the brand has just grown over those 50 years to be in 22,000 gyms globally and with 140,000 instructors. So just reaching people in many more ways over those um, decades. And now, you know, what we've seen the last kind of five years, even pre-COVID reaching people in new ways at home, at work, um, and I think that trend is just going to continue. But I think, I mean, right this moment, we're focused on just getting people back through the doors. Like there is kind of excitement. You can just feel it when you're talking to the rest of the team and the teams around Europe, especially just how excited we are about live group fitness being back. Um, and Emma, as you said, the report that's just been um, published, it just absolutely speaks volumes to that on the excitement that both the industry, but new people to the fitness category of feeling for group exercise and just that connection that we've all been craving for for the last 18 months so just around you know we're really sort of laser focused on that navigating you know out of lockdown how we bring live group x back in the strongest way possible but not forgetting all the things that we learned and experienced over the last 18 months because you know there's always a silver lining you know even to a pandemic so there's things that will be here to stay um which is you know exciting for us and the whole category Thank you so much. So just to frame the way that I've structured this session is each of our panelists will actually take on a big chunky topic and then we'll pile at the end if there's anything to add. And this way we felt we could give you the most value. So just to frame the questions, um, we've all watched um, some pretty horrific headlines hit fitness, particularly Group X on the way through. Um, We've, we've been told gyms are dead. We've been told that gyms are unsafe. They're a Petri dish. We've been told that we're not essential. Um, and then I think gradually we've watched the Ursas and we've watched the, um, the Europe actives and we've watched the UK actives all fight politic 
gov uh, your government arguments. We've we've seen fitness when you take it away, people then realise how important it is, and we're just really seeing a lot of negative trends. So the point is, we got all this bad press, but it's becoming evident now how important we are. Now at the same time, we're also blending with other industries. We've got big tech, we've got big fit tech, we've got lifestyle, food, nutrition, athleisure, you name it. Everyone's piling into lifestyle, but with that is becoming is coming collective marketing dollars and, and all of those things. So there's a greater awareness and we're going to speak in this session a bit about the new customer, the new person to group, group exercise, the new person to a gym, the health customer, you know, someone who's actually worked out I'm not healthy and I'm at, I'm, I'm at risk, not just from COVID, but from everything because I'm not healthy. So we're really seeing a growth of the pie of fitness, which is one of the positive outtakes that we want you to take from this session. So I'm going to open, I'm going to be provocative. Um, I'm going to quote Mr. John Foley, so uh, CEO of Peloton. So, and he also represents all connected fitness. And um, so, you know, you've got your, your Pelotons, obviously, your Mirror, your Tonal, your Hydro, Climber, which is going bonkers here in the US right now. Um, and he quoted, he quoted, gyms are a broken model of yesteryear. Um, and in response to that, uh, the panel is going to uh, uh, attack some of those topics that sit underneath that. I would also like to reference before we leap into Amy, who's going to take us through some of the trends, reference Ian Mullane's white papers. We did do a couple of podcasts on that earlier in the year. If you haven't seen those, please do them. They're a great 101. Uh, one is the fitness future and the other one is data and AI. It just gives you a quick 101 on digital fitness and everything you need to know about understanding that as we step into this new world. So, Amy, I'm going to get you to take us through uh, the trend oh, the trend report, um, basically from Les Mills, which I believe went to over 12,000 people, so it's, and, and right across the world. So it really is representative of many, many markets. And we're not all exactly the same, but there are some commonalities across all. So um, let us know all about those top headlines, Amy, and also where people can find the report, because I know Les Mills has made that available free of charge. Yeah, thanks, Emma. And um, I think just to start, it's definitely not uh, matching that quote of a broken model of yesteryear, which uh, everything we're all delighted and fully committed behind. Um, but yeah, the global report launched this week um, and we surveyed 12,000 people over 15 countries um, over the last couple of months. Um, and fascinating to see some of those trends coming out. I'll pop the, um, the link in the chat box and back shortly and I'll send it across to your practice as well. But you know, the, the trends that we're seeing is, you know, after 18 months, people cannot wait to get back to live fitness. And as, as I said, that excitement and that desire, you can, it's, you can just feel it in the, in the air. Um, but when we look at those post, post pandemic markets, the ones that are, you know, recovering out and opening up, um, club visits per member are 110% of pre COVID levels. So you're seeing those people who've got that desire to get back and come back more. Then Group X attendance is 119% of pre-COVID levels. So again, that, um, that myth and that rumour that was kind of circulating while we were deep in darkest lockdown of, you know, gyms being dead is absolutely not the case. And the, um, what we've seen in, in this report and the trends is that um, fitness um, is still the biggest global sport. So 75% of regular exercisers do at least one gym, gym type of activity. And that is just massive for our industry that is the biggest sport um, out there. And, you know, we've just come back off the Olympics and the Paralympics and, you know, gym-based activity is, is number one. And within that, live fitness classes um, are the single most popular gym type of activity. So, you know, the fact that um, there were those rumours um, sticking around, but, you know, the, we've now got the data to prove otherwise. And I think gyms will be seeing that of people flooding back through the door. Anyway, and as we come into September, that kind of peak month, I think it's going to be like no other we've seen this year. The September kind of rush is, is absolutely going to be felt. Um, and kind of going into those specifics a bit more around Group X specifically, um, we've seen that two thirds of gym members prefer to work out with others um, in either small groups or large groups. And, you know, I know that everyone on the panel kind of feels that, but it's that connection that you get with others in a group fitness class, whether that's the motivation from the instructor, the community feel, um, and, you know, there's... there's <laughs> 
nothing like a lockdown and a pandemic to kind of crave that uh, social connection um, that we're already seeing in, in place, but it's just kind of really shown kind of the value that that instructor in that community class type field can bring. Um, also kind of if, when we dug, dug into some of the, the barriers that people are seeing, um, and you know, this is probably not a shock to anybody, but motivation is still that biggest barrier. So whether you're new to fitness category or you want to be working out more, motivation is cited as the number one reason why people, you know, don't work out more. And, you know, if we then flip that back around of the, the role that the instructor can play, again, that is the number one reason for people joining classes. That quality of the instructor is the, the main driver and the reason that people will keep coming, keep coming back. So, you know, like you said, Emma, we'll, we'll share that report, but, um, you know, just some of those top, top line trends that, you know, Live Group X is back and we couldn't be more excited. The role that that connection, the role that the instructor plays is has never been more important. Um, kind of though, just sort of, you know, touching back on what we've seen this last 80, 18 months, and I know there's some, a million different words, whether it's omnichannel, digital or blended, you know, those trends are also here to stay. And as you said and alluded to at the start, that's not a bad thing. That's a, you know, really brilliant and exciting for the thing for the category. Um, in terms of the trends that we're, we're predicting and what people are, think that they will be kind of engaging with going forward is that people who have a gym membership, 80% um, are quoted to say that they will still have their digital um, workout options. So 80% of all gym members are still gonna have that hybrid approach. Then if you kind of go into that in a, a, again, a bit more granularly, there's, it's, it's looking like a 60-40 split between 60% in the gym and 40% at home. And we know that kind of the convenience that we've seen at that at home, that flexibility, working it around, you know, our crazy busy lives. But then on the flip side, you get that connection, that motivation, that driver from the club. So that 60-40 split is that prediction of what people are going to kind of use um, going forward with that, with that blend. Um, but that again, just sort of cements kind of what we've all seen last year of the role digital will play. Um, it's not a threat. It's actually going to kind of bring more people in. You know, that walking past the Group X um, studio, you know, in the past when you're like, whoa, I've never seen that. I'm not going to enter there. Actually, people can now try that in their living room and think, OK, not so bad. I'm going to come into the, the category. So we've seen that growth happen the last 18 months. And now it's about bringing those new people into studio. So I think you know, it's really exciting time to see that live coming back, but underneath that, having that, you know, ongoing flexibility is a key trend. Thanks, Amy. I just want to pick up on a couple of your points. So first of all, we are social beasts. So, you know, the human race, you know, we do love to be together generally. We like our time alone as well, but we do like to come together. So I think that is a basic human need, I think is also driving this category. Um, I also think the split, and I talk to a lot of club owners, recently and they're saying oh you know our digital part has dropped off since the clubs are opening expect that because there's going to be a real settling period over the next two to three years where we find our way but look to more advanced uh, industries look to retail look to uh, look to travel that have already blended you're doing some stuff live you're doing some stuff that's digitally enhanced so it's just it's going to to measure out there and I love the stats that you're pushing there and, and then let's just also think about the customer journey. So again, when we work, what do we all hang our hat on? Uh, attendance, right? How many times do people come to our facilities? And from that, we can predict everything. When they're going to leave, who they're going to bring, um, whether they're going to get a result, all of those things. So start thinking about the customer journey on how many touch points do I have with your brand across the week, whether it's in person or whether I'm wearing your shirt or whether I'm doing the 20 minute core workout or the meditation before bed. These are all touch points that keep me engaged in my journey of health and wellness of which you are one of the contributors. So again, Ian talks very strongly about club being hub. The club is the hub, it is the relationship. Memberships become relationships. When you hold on to that relationship, you become the church, you become the, the meeting point for people. And if we double down on that aspect, you will never lose that. And I just wanna give a shout out to everyone in the group exercise land, no one turned up like you during the pandemic. We were the first to go online, the first to pick up the phone, the first to give shout outs, uh, so go you. 
ladies, have you got anything that you wanted to throw into this trends topic right now? Probably just just from my side then, Emma, just because I, I, Amy, when we were talking through the, the stats ahead of the call and I, I read through the Les Mills report, I thought it was really interesting because when we first went out, um, and I know there were lots of reports that came out over the sort of start of the pandemic because there was rumours that gyms would open and they didn't open in the UK, which was like super frustrating. And our customers certainly said it was like 78% of people that said, I'm going to keep using at home fitness in particular so that that video virtual element as well as my in-studio routine I'm totally confident I'm going to do that and then we went back out and did it again and it's about 38% so I was really interested when I saw that 60-40 split because I think we, we I guess my message was when I was reflecting on it was we just can't rely on old data so if anyone's looking at those demand volumes thinking I'm going to have that 80% of my customer base who are going to buy into digital 40% is still amazing, like there's still demand there and as long as you integrate the digital proposition right, but the synergy between our reporting and what came out of your report, Amy, was really interesting. So it's like, I think that is the threshold that we're going to be looking at. Right, thank you. Another global trend that's that's really interesting um, that, that pertains kind of more to uh, an operational perspective and just getting to creating that experience is um, something that is being called the great resignation right now. And it's really a um, result of only 7% 7% of workers being satisfied with where they're at in their careers and the jobs that they're currently holding. And so you're seeing literally in the US as a case in point, two thirds of Americans who are looking for new jobs. And so I think that's important to consider both from a consumer per perspective um, that your customers are in this process of transition uh, in their lives and they're looking particularly for something more meaningful to occupy their time with. A lot of this is a result of people really reconsidering as a result of the pandemic, the way that their lives are shaped. People moving a lot has been a huge trend, but also a consideration when it comes to staffing and recruiting um, and how folks are going to be looking at employers and how uh, perhaps you can, through your culture, through your practices, through being able to provide an opportunity that and, and a culture, uh, a, a working organizational culture that is meaningful for folks. It's going to be really important as um, people are actually looking to their, their next thing when it comes to work. Thanks, Amir. And we're seeing a lot of that. Um, we started a, a executive search brand during the pandemic, Good Soul Hunting, and we're definitely finding that everyone is in transition. Businesses are in transition, individuals are in transition, they want to go from here to here. And we see a lot of people saying no to really good roles because it's just not 100% values aligned or it's just not where they want to be spending their life force. So we're definitely feeling like everyone got sent back to the room, think about what you did, come back and now really reorganize your life in terms of true priority. So we're definitely seeing that. I also want to throw a couple of more stats here from the US. So Amira, we're going to head into you now. You're going to give us some, some more nuanced um, um, uh, things that you're seeing in our future customer. But here in the US, at least, according to Ursa, we've lost 9,000 clubs, about 22% of our market, and about 1.5 million people have left the industry, either furloughed forever, got let go, or have decided to leave. So that's quite a dent, but we're also seeing expansion at the same time. Franchising is on fire, licensing is on fire, exponential, all these brands are beginning to grow. So if you have a great concept and it's really well run, it's going to be a good, it's going to be a good future for you. So let's pivot a little bit now, Amira. Um, so you're very tuned into, so you're you're on Apple Innovation Teams, you're 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 of an age group that that has come from you know, huge shift in our industry. We've kind of got the institutionalized feeling of fitness. You're definitely part of the new school. And I feel that every time we speak, but the future needs of our consumers, let's talk about the 2025 fitness consumer. What do you think they're going to deem as important? And as importantly, what do we do to get ready for that future? Definitely. And I love that framing the 2025 fitness consumer am I? as we know the, the customer is at the center of everything that we do um and so it's just important to consider and, and and frame in the context of their lives so here's what we're seeing from the ground up in classes across our community and even directionally increasing um so still connected to trends and so first off in our industry uh, at our home base what we 
we call we do we call it group fitness and i might encourage um our audiences those who are watching this right now to really rethink this and that what we offer is considered from that consumer's eyes the class what we're providing is their class um, and it can be an in-person group setting one day but as we talked about on another day it could be an individual experience on demand at home potentially partially connected um, as we've mentioned and so um, overall this 2025 fitness consumer is incredibly and increasingly sophisticated. They'll probably have audited your method, which you better have a method, a real method. Um, definitely all of your reviews, which will be public before walking into the door or hitting the play button. Um, they're gonna ap really appreciate convenience um, as we've seen uh, be an important priority. But here's one thing to note. They will also go out of their way for a worthy novel special experience that they can look forward to feel amazing during and become their best self through. Um, they're really gonna be craving that. Um, they're gonna support the latest in performance enhancing fashion. Uh, Emma, you had mentioned uh, active wear. That's going to be something that is continuing to grow. Uh, they're gonna wear a heart rate monitor. So we're seeing more and more uh, of these uh, wearables and, and, and heart rate monitors. Uh, I know Tribe has um, some, some uh, positions on that as well. Um, have a motion routine that schedules a, a mix, that blend of cardio strength, mind, body, et cetera. Uh, around an increasingly specific goal set um, for which, you know, women, for example, may include uh, something called cycle syncing, so menstrual cycle syncing, so an increasingly sophisticated sense of, you know, how can I tailor this to my body and, and um, related have a dialed in nutrition plan to match their microbiome. So there's an increasing amount of science and testing around this. Um, they'll know that an equipment setting around difficulty is actually relative and should be personalized group class or not, um, continue to increasingly look uh, to the instructor as a values aligned role model and spiritual leader. So not just a fitness expert to Amy's point around that instructor being just so increasingly critical uh, and the number one reason that folks come into class and they're gonna crave the most motivating music that aligns with um, that motion, that tempo aligning with the motion and the exertion intensity as well. Uh, they'll appreciate something to share with their followers about, whether that is on Instagram or um, TikTok or another social platform. Uh, and outside of the class, they will be in search of a deeper sense of life fulfillment. This relates to that great resignation trend, but also just beyond, uh, including novel experiences. Outside of your class, they're going to feel hyper busy and under more stress than ever under more mental duress. So mental health has been a huge trend that we've been seeing, uh, thankfully being talked about more and more, uh, especially during uh, such turbulent times. Uh, and they're gonna be always on fast moving and will be also mindful, socially mindful about the impact of their purchases. So, wow, how do we prepare for this tidal wave? My question actually is, how can we capitalize on this opportunity? I think knowing is a third of the battle uh, you know, really thinking about aligning on planning is that next third of the battle. And, and the other third is really execution. And those are all really critically important. Um, I'm sure every single point here, every single one of those data points stimulates ideas in a unique way that aligns with your concept, that adds to your concept. But this is a moment to really recenter, get clear, as well as be thoughtful about your brand values, what distinctly you are uniquely offering, how that's different from the rest, and be methodical and systematic about how you deliver on that special product. Wow, <laughs> thank you very much. And I get a couple of things from that, Amira. I get a really deep focus. So um, get really good at what you're really good at, like get really good at that. And then basically we're seeing all around us, I mean, we've been through so many pandemics, we've got the pandemic, then we've got everything else happening as around. And the, my second word from yours would be hyper-personalized. You know, we really have to understand, we know, we know from our purchasing decisions, our whole life is getting lined up exactly how we like it. And we need to do the same with fitness. So this is a call to action, call to arms for our whole industry to get better and double down on what we do. A couple of extra stats in there. So over 50% of US households now are wearing wearables so to your point we're beginning to self-regulate self-automate our own health our own wellness and we know that that's apple's big dream and tim talks about it all the time so we know that we're democratizing that you know you've, you've got a gym and you've got a hospital on your wrist or on your phone right now that is the new future 
And then I don't know if anyone saw it, but uh, if not, please jump on. It'll be on YouTube or wherever, but jump on the unveiling of the next level of WHOOP. So Will Armour just launched that yesterday, I believe. And now they're taking the WHOOP and you can put it in clothing. So now you essentially have censored clothing. It's been being worked on. It's one of the big topics that comes out of CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, which will be in January. Again, a live event here in Las Vegas. But just have a look at that and you'll see how quickly things are moving. So people have very deep data sets now on how they're sleeping, how they're eating, how they're resting, how much strain is in their body, what they should be doing today to be optimal them. So just that is the new world. So if it's new to you, make sure that you look into that. You might have an experience that doesn't lean strongly into metrics, but just know that your customers will be knowing more and more about themselves. So don't be putting up stuff like you just burnt a thousand calories and this, that, and the other, if you don't have the data supporting it, because they will be wearing something on their ring, on their wrist, around their middle that tells them something else. So just be aware of that. Uh, ladies, is there anything you wanted to pile into those incredible insights from Amira? I'll echo you, Emma, that, wow, that was um, awesome to hear. I think um, just what Amira was saying around um, people analyzing everything before they, they've got, in, you know, gone to a, a class or, and you know, being so aware of what your offering is and, you know, probably could talk about your brand, you know, inside out. And so I think that just for us in the industry, just really being aware of that branded experience. And because there is going to be that um, interchange between the gym and at home, actually ensuring that your brand expression is similar in both. So thinking about the quality of your online offering and your in-studio offering and ensuring that they're mirroring each other, they're connected, it's similar experience that you would get between the two so that it does feel like that connection to your, your brand. Um, with Amira saying that, you know, they're going to know inside out, they're going to check those reviews, they're going to be flexible. And so they need to know that it's your brand that they're doing when they press that play button or when they walk into that studio. And I think that's just, that's just key. So quality, quality content is just going to keep, continue to rise. Yeah. And I'll also add that fitness is contextual. So you need to be, if I'm going to go to your live experience, you need to be good enough that you're going to be better than the screen at home. Like I want to go because I want the social connections. I want those human moments. I want to be pushed a little harder because I've got someone to the right and the left of me. So think about those moments that you can dial up the humanness of them. Because then if I'm just getting my cardio in or my yoga in or my meditation, I might do that in the dark in the garage, you know, and I'm actually fine to do that. Occasionally, I want to go to a fitness festival and I want my socks knocked off me. I want the parties. I want the lights, the camera, the action. But it's very much like shows. Then I like to go home and listen to the perfectly recorded J Lo, Lo song, but then I'll go to the concert for the entertainment. So start thinking about filling out that whole experience because we'd also get bored if we went to a J Lo concert every day of the week. Like, so just think about it. We've got to fill out that whole experience, but it is slightly contextual, but you've got to have that through line of the brand. I know I'm at home. I know what I'm doing. That right balance of um, consistency, but also surprise and delight. It's got to be a little bit of both because we're tricky, we humans. We like things quite, you know, like this, but then we also like to be surprised to keep uh, peaked, our, our, our interest peaked. Uh, anything to add there, Kirsty? No, I think it's just an, it's an amazing segue, obviously, into the next section when we talk about um, scale of that live uh, fitness environment for a brand like Tribe, because humanness with a technology element, which sounds like a massive juxtaposition, but is, is where we're focused, is, uh, is exactly how we've sort of looked at scaling up for that um, beautifully complex 2025 consumer that Amira has described for us. Yeah, that's great. So let's, let's continue with you. So I would love to hear, so Tribe, while you do have a digital expression and you do support your customer base like that, you are doubling down on live experience. Like you are... Uh, rapidly expanding, a hit concept, uh, franchising also, um, UK, Spain, with Bitcoin, I might add. You guys are just <laughs> far ahead of the curve. Tell us a bit about that. Finland, Russia, and also just recently partnered with the Urban Gym Group, who are now going to spread your brand through the Benelux over the next five years. So perhaps could you tell us why you are so bullishly backing live? I mean, just some of the cool nuances of Tribe that make you so successful. You know, why is it just this, this, why are you roaring into new markets? Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, 
we, I, would, I wouldn't deny, like, um, COVID has been, it's been a challenging time, I think, for all of us. But I think one of the things it's allowed us to do, although I would never call it downtime, um, is just reflect on what's, uh, like Amira said, what's special, what's unique about Tribe, and try and stay very true to that. Um, and I think, you know, just based on the conversations we've had, that's the thing that's hooked those partners in. So the people like Jardy from the Urban Gym Group to sort of move this product into other, into other territories. I mean, from our side, we're, we're back in our live concepts to the hilt, and what we've actually done is move our digital offering so it's better integrated with what I would call uh, the umbrella, uh, which is the heart rate system. So it was interesting, Amira said that everybody's going to be wearing heart rate monitors in, in four years. So we've uh, we've certainly tried to connect or make that the connector between the two experiences, because I agree with Amy, you don't want something that's completely disconnected from that live studio experience. I mean, for us, when we, um, one of the things that's probably been beneficial for us, and I, I don't like often talking about too many of the positives of the last 18 months, because it's been a big strain on everybody, but one of the things it's helped us do is kind of prove the resilience of boutique fitness with the right structure and the right focus, because uh, the tribe model is super interesting. We call it the, the volume boutique model, although that's certainly phrased behind ourselves, uh, which is that kind of like maximization of space. And it's something that, um, my CEO, so Kevin Yates, who's the founder of Tribe, that was his vision, number one, take it out of London and prove that it can be done outside of capital cities. And then number two was being able to scale it up so there was some serious volume in that studio without losing those like personal touches and those, what is now a very precious commodity, I think is how Ian Mullane described it, which is that human interaction, that thing that makes people come back. And so even with distancing measures, um, and they've been serious across all territories that tribe operate in. Um, at certain points of last year, for the most part, we were at 33% capacity, uh, occupancy, sorry, or we, or we were closed. So they're, they're the challenges that we face. But even with that in place, all of the UK tribe locations were EBITDA and cash positive last year for every month that they were open. And we were at about 90% of pre-COVID usage with 33% capacity. So it's a the model it weathers distancing which was a big part of, of, of being able to come through that and really show people that it's a it's a super effective business model it also incidentally for franchising makes it easier to go out and say look to be break even you have to have average capacity of less, occupancy of less than 27 percent so it seriously works hence the bullish expansion over the last 18 months I mean, I think from our side, and, and I've certainly from a sort of brand perspective, been able to really step back and reflect a little bit on Tribe over the last 18 months. I think what makes Tribe special, to be honest, as makes many boutique fitness operators special is people uh, and community. And, and, I love, and I love seeing that element of the coach and the, and the trainer is, at, is really at the heart of, of some of that interaction. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Can you still hear me? All good. Uh, yeah, so people are at the heart of that interaction. Um, and what we tried to do is um, stay in our lane a little bit. So there was a, there's always that, um, should we be doing something different with digital? Do we need to make it about, do we need to go into mental well-being? Do we need to do different disciplines? But um, one of the things that we always quote a tribe is, number one, everything matters. So being able to stay really focused on experience, um, and all of the details that comprise that experience. And number two, whatever we do, we want to be best in the world at it. So we don't want to stray into stuff that we're not, we don't really have credibility for. We just want to be um, with flexibility within a framework and within our lane so we can just be top class at what we do. Um, and that's kind of steered, and this would be my advice really speaking on this panel and, and getting to work with some amazing sort of products and experience innovators in the tribe business is working out what that purpose and that hook is for the business and the thing that makes it so special and then gravitating all of your innovation and your technology technological development around that customer experience of what you want that to look like and um, because for example i was um getting into the detail of ian's report which is really interesting the future of fitness report and um, and there was so much about automation and technology and uh, not trying to reinvent the wheel was a really interesting point that came out of that. Um, and what, what I really liked about it is that I've looked closely at the innovation that Tribe is doing. And I've realized actually the, 
the hook of it all is to make sure that people are still at the center, which I think is a, is a cool place to be. Um, so for example, with our heart rate system, which connects the sides of our business, so it connects the offline and the online, some of the automation that we're doing in the studio, for example, at the moment is making sure that we're set, we can really celebrate achievements. So all of the group achievements and the personal achievements of uh, what we call tribers, so our customers within the studio, um, but also things like just automating the light show, the programming, the music. So it's all in tempo with each other, not so that we can take the people out of the equation, but so that people can be present in the situation. So they can start really interacting with the people in that studio. So I agree with you, if people are not there, I might as well have done it at home and not be there and not, not have that interaction. So that's kind of been the focus of our innovation over the last, probably the last 18 months, but there's lots of digital transformation going on at Tribe at the moment, but all with the idea that we're going to put people as they always have been, but really centered at the heart of our business. Thanks so much, Kirsty. And I just want to pause on boutique fitness generally, just for a second, because they've really led innovation over the last decade, I would say. I mean, we've bought this huge focus, um, absolutely doubling down on the emotional experience, the multi-sensory experience, the lights, the smells, the service. And they've done a very good job of uh, interacting or bringing in technology in a way that supports. So we've all, you know, many of us have worked in clubs, many of you will be club owners out there, where you go through the turnstile and then I have no idea what you do, you know, and I don't know what kind of experience you have and I don't know who you have it with. When you're in a boutique, it's single file, you're through one kind of experience, it is managed. I know who checked in, I know who your best friend is, I know how many times you've been this week, I know what your heart rate is, I know this, I know that. And so I'm able to customize in the same way that Apple's doing, I'm able to customize what you don't even know you need yet. So there's definitely this predictive element, which again is one of Ian's big topics. Gamification, multi-sensory experience. These are things that we as the whole industry need to start embracing. If you're a club, a boutique, whatever it is, how do I wrap my arms fully around my customer and give them an amazing experience that's, that's, that, that grabs them in many, many ways. It hasn't just got one hook. It's got the fantastic instructor, the beautiful sound system, the for service, the after service. It's got the little things. If I want more of the brand, I can. If I travel, I can take it with me. Um, I, you know, I, I'm happy to wear their billboard across my chest that's when you know that you've got success. So I just wanted to make that point. Ladies, do you have anything else to add into this particular discussion before I ask for any closing thoughts and advice? I think just um, reflecting on, I mean, clearly with the, the folks in the room, like a common thread between us around um, the importance of methodological delivery and, and be, being very prepared you know, it's not just, you know, just showing up, winging it. And it's something that, um, you know, in, in the past, um, there are brand associations, right, with like the old model of um, group fitness and, and choreograph classes and folks just winging it. And that just being less and less acceptable going into the future. So coming into your business, coming into um, that experience with a prepared mind, with a focused mind, and with a methodolo methodological approach um, is something that, you know, I, I can reflect on is, is, is a connecting thread um, between, between the folks here. I think also um, there is something to be seen uh, very much when it comes to the predictive experience creation. Um, we are collecting a lot of data today. The data set is growing. The measurement tools are growing. Um, but once that is amassed, what, you know, thinking about how we can utilize that in uh, predictive algorithms, utilization of machine learning, when it comes to being able to both personalize and predict that next, that next generation experience, uh, it, it is something that I think will be really interesting to watch in the future. We haven't gotten there yet. Thanks, I just, just want to um, say how much I loved what Kirsty was saying around, um, you know, the, the added experience that they're bringing to their brand, whether it's the lights, the, the, the music, but then that's not taking away from the, the people, it's enhancing that experience. I just love that. And I, I think, yeah, it's so true right now. Um, and just yeah. make that experience so special and kind of what people come back for. 
Wonderful. Thank you. So closing thoughts. This has been incredible and I, I've learned so much and I hope our listeners out there do as well. Just final thoughts, lookouts, watch outs, plan for just things that you'd love people to walk away from this session with. Amira, let's start with you, then Kirsty, then Amy. Definitely. I think a major theme and, and something that I continue to impress upon, uh, whether it's entrepreneurs or folks who are working for those um, entrepreneurs or folks even coming into to classes is to really double down on what your core values are, what your core brand values are as a business, and really even take the time to write them down uh, and to see through, you know, assess, analyze throughout your process, through your operations, through your actual offering and product, how those va values manifest themselves, um, because that's going to be such a huge and important distinguishing factor, technology or not, you know, certain type of programming or not, um, throughout the entirety of um, the brand product and the offering that you're going to be bringing to the fore as we get into the future of uh, the group fitness landscape. Thanks so much. See, I love that. And that was exactly one of the ones I wanted to raise. So you beat me to it, Amira. Um, but I guess uh, something you said that really resonates with me, and we, I'd say we are like right in the infancy of the process in terms of machine learning and understanding and forecasting. Um, a big focus I would say right now, not just, for, not just for the business that I operate in, but for all businesses will be insight and really being able to mine that data and understand a little more about the customer and not be, because um, I really was thinking about uh, one of the themes that came up at the start around like hyper-personalization, even within that group setting. Um, and I think there's innovation to be done in the studio and in that live fitness class, but there's also innovation to be done exactly as you said, Emma, with being able to surface information. There's a group fitness setting, it's, it's easier to cultivate relationships anyway, but knowing, knowing those really important things about the people who walk through the door, so they feel very special and, and very welcome and like they belong, which is an intrinsic human need. And, but also being able to roll that through communications, uh, which is obviously really key for a role like mine, a role like Amy's, is those communications start to get like hyper-personalized and the recommendations that we can make to people. And um, so they feel like they can progress. And that's been such a key part of development on the heart rate system at, at Tribe, for example, is people being able to see I am progressing and I am, it's not, it's how I feel, but I can also see it. And um, so I would say if your data is a little messy, uh, or, you're, or you're not, you know, kind of not interrogating it, then take a little bit of time to focus on it because there's so much, just so much rich insight there that you can couple with those consumer trends that brands like Les Mills are surfacing. Wonderful, thanks. Um, yeah, couldn't agree more with those, those two points. Um, I think for me, it's, um, continue to focus on your people, um, especially your instructors, um, just as, as a brand and an experience, um, you know, your, your people and, you know, on the front line, they're your biggest USP. Um, you know, that's the area that your rivals, big tech, you know, can't replicate your, your people are going to what, you know, brings your brand to life. So I think whether that is from development and um, progression of your instructors, whether that's kind of your wider team, like people will continue to be key, despite that, you know, amazing trends and, and kind of advancement in technology, which is huge and going to be awesome. You know, you've still got your people and your team at the heart. So, you know, bring that out as much as possible in the next year. Ladies, this has been phenomenal. I want to thank each and every one of you. Just, I've got pages and pages of notes and I'm sure our, our watchers out there have the same. And I just have some closing comments. Uh, and first of all, remember to uh, register for EHFF, which is coming up in November. So the slide will be coming up for that shortly. So number one, there is a new health conscious beginner, I want to get moving client, customer, member out there. We have to do a better job at enticing them in. We have more chances now than ever to help people find something that they really, really affiliate with, they really resonate with because of boutique and connected fitness and clubs and all the marketing and all the love that's coming from the broader lifestyle brand is going to help us build a bigger uh, offering to our members. So that's the first thing. Secondly, group fitness is the biggest sport in the world. We are in the biggest sport in the world. No one does anything else more than they do what we do. So let's lean into that in the confidence of that as well. Number three, we are social beasts. Okay, we belong together. We seek out 
uh, experiences that we can do together. So lean into that, be more human, build more wow, more connection, more awesome, more more competition, whatever it is, all those things that are important to your customer base. <clears throat> Number four, it's a new world. There are new expectations. We all have to lift our game. Trust the data. We have no clue what next year is going to be like. Let's be frank. No one knows what's going to happen, but follow what is important to your members and adjust. Get really nimble and get okay with that change. No one can crystal ball gaze the future. So just listen to your data and move accordingly. Number five, we are in the motivation business. Okay, and exercise is hard. So we, we kind of need to wrap it up in something that's really fun because it's not something, you know, we're lazy inherently, right? We'd sit on the couch and do Netflix and chips all day long if we probably had the choice, unless you're that 5% of those annoying friends that you have. So motivation is hard. We are the best at doing it because we, we hide it in all these amazing things that give people a great result. And one of my final points is group exercise, group fitness. The fitness industry is professionalizing. There is so much resource, so much great talent, so much energy going into group exercise right now that we have to lift our game. People are devoting their life to this. They're not just doing a couple of hours, a couple of times a week. It's becoming a professional business. So in whichever way you can lift that game and become better, do so. Our future is bright. I want to finish on that note. And I want to finish on a couple of words of our namesake. So Les Mills Sr. Back in 1968 said the role of the fitness industry is to help people fall in love with fitness. And I think here we are in 2021, 22, and it still holds. Our job is to get people to fall in love with this part of their life because it helps them be a fully functioning human who's happy and contributing to their community. And Amira talked to it, you know, when I'm feeling like I'm my full self, my full happy self, look out. And that's our gift to humanity. So I want to thank EHFF for having this panel. Thank you, David, who's behind the scenes making all of this work. Um, we hope to see you in November. Please register for that now. And um, thank you once again to our sponsors. Again, these things do not happen without them. There's the date there, the 3rd of November. It's going to be a wonderful get together again of the industry. And thank you so much to EHFF for all the work that you've done, all these fireside chats. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you so much. And thank you, panelists. <laughs>